No, I do think kids are innately curious. They are innately interesting and interested. They're innately eager to learn and to share what they're doing with others. And um, it is astonishing how we generally manage to bludgeon that out of folks by the time they get out of high school. Um, now, there's a number of explanations, and I think that they all have merit. One of them, and I don't think it's the most important, but I think we should consider it, is that educational techniques are always at least 50 years behind what we know about human nature and learning processes. So we're still teaching as if Skinner had something to say about people and education. He had a lot to say about pigeons, and he also, frankly, is a formidable intellect, and I don't deny that environmental contingencies dramatically influence behavioral outcomes, but I vehemently take issue with his conception of humans as fundamentally blank slates that ought be and are or let me reverse that, that who are and ought be almost exclusively determined by the vagaries of their surroundings. You know, that's where you get grades, and that's where you get, you know, the strategic use of carrots and sticks. And, um, you know, the folks in psychology, the intrinsic motivation people like Rich Ryan, who we had with us in Israel, you know, they've demonstrated that the best way, if you have a kid who loves to do something and you want to stifle that, reward them for doing it. So we know that one difficulty is that we're still operating on an idea that is so superficially sensible but nevertheless wrong. You know, it is sensible that if you drop a Volkswagen and a pebble from the top of a building that the Volkswagen's going to hit the ground first, but it's wrong. It's also sensible that if you want somebody to do something well that you reward them for that, but that only works for something that people don't like or that they can already do. So I think one part of it is an inadvertent result of operating on presumptions about learning that are known to be untrue. So I think part of it is that educational practice has not even remotely caught up to what we now know. That's a correctable error though, mm -hmm. right? So sure. that all that would, and that doesn't happen in places, let's say, you know, Finland is supposedly has the best teachers. and. There's evidently two reasons for that. They're paid as well as doctors, and you actually have to be able in a discipline to become a teacher. So 90% of the people that apply to become teachers in Finland are rejected. Most teachers come from the bottom half of their classes. And so I think part of the problem are, uh, you know, we, we have not especially able people operating on faulty assumptions. So that, that's no good. Yeah, that's no good. Then there's a, a more seemingly sinister notion, and I'm going to have to get back to you on who said this. These are some guys at MIT who are economists, and they argue that education always produces the kind of people necessary to sustain a social order at any given time. And this is going to sound cynical, but it's not. They're, they just said that in order for America to keep being America, we basically need a population of docile people able to follow orders in a mindless fashion 
without thinking too much because that's what they're going to be doing for most of their lives. And they're not saying that someone is on a throne somewhere saying we need docile, mindless people, but that quite unconsciously institutions perpetuate themselves. Mm -hmm. And I find that also somewhat appealing uh, as I, I do think that um, there, there really is something to that. We are, after all, the only democratic society that doesn't have universal health care or, or, you know, cradle to grave social services. Every other culture where people reach a certain level of educational proficiency, the first thing they do is to vote those things in for themselves. And so what some people say is that also is a factor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that can you imagine what would happen in five minutes if Americans started to vote based on the facts and what was in their best interest. And I, I think that mm -hmm. is also relevant. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, I'm honestly at a loss because I... You know, my kids went to public school. We were involved in their schools. I found that the teachers meant well. They were decent and able. And my kids still came out somewhat disengaged and disenfranchised, mm -hmm. much to my chagrin. So, and that would, I guess that raises a third thing, and that's that we are... As a culture, there, Americans have always had an anti-intellectual streak. Uh, you know, Frank Zappa said in 1980 that the average American treats intelligent behavior as if it was some sort of hideous physical deformity. <laughs> and, you know, it's Zappa, but... <laughs> but I like it. Yeah, I but I like it. it. Yeah. Um, and, and that also, you know, it is not cool to... Um, to be studious and diligent. And um, I think we need to correct that too. Surely this is part of it, where too much of educational experiences for the youth are passive under the guise of imposing attention and discipline. Mm -hmm. You know, my kids thrived in nursery school where they got to play with clay mm -hmm. and draw stuff. Mm -hmm. And science was boring until they got to do it. You know, they didn't want to hear about it, but when they got the beaker of water and the Bunsen burner and were asked to figure out at what temperature it boiled, then it got awfully enticing. Mm -hmm. So I think that mm -hmm. is, is... Is part of it, is, more hands-on kind of Is part of it. But that's costly and, um, and will require, you know, a radical uh, reconfiguration of how we allocate scarce resources. Mm -hmm. But I also think uh, we, we have a lot to do in terms of fostering uh, cooperation and collaboration. Um, this gets back to, uh, you know, a, a, a very American grotesque exaggeration of the natural tendency to want to be, to want to stick out a little bit. Mm -hmm. But we've raised that to almost the sole preoccupation of I've got to be the best at what I do. Like when I talk to the Skidmore students, I'll, I'll say to them, you know, who remembers ever doing great on an exam? And of course, they're all like, of course I remember that. And then I'm like, and who remembers when you look over and the kid next to you did great also? And you're like, fuck. You know, that their success undermines my own achievement Mm -hmm. Why should that be? Why can't there be even more joy when everyone is successful? Mm -hmm. um,
And that's one of the things I love, by the way, about the kids in this summer program, the disadvantaged kids. Uh -huh. These are kids who generally, even working at their hardest, tend to barely be able to get C's at the college level. Remember, after all, they're disadvantaged. And there were one or two kids that got A's this summer on their exams. And the, one of the teachers mentioned that. She said, you know, most of you got C's, D's, and F's. That's okay because, you know, that's why you're here. But there were one or two students who actually got A's. And we don't grade the work. We don't let the students put their names on their work because we want to emphasize that we're not judging them. We're judging their words. And that's also very important when you differentiate between the person and their efforts. You don't suck. You're great. This work, however, sucks at present. And the fact of the matter is, is that our job is to make your work as great as we believe you to be. But anyway, the kids were all like, who got an A? Who got an A? And we were like, we're not telling you because that's not important. You shouldn't worry about, you know, who's getting an A. And the kids said, no, we, we want to know because we want to congratulate those people. And so we said, okay, we're not, this is not for us to decide if the kids who did get an A want to identify themselves, well, that will be up to them. So anyway, one of the girls, she goes like this. She's like, well, I, I got an A. All 40 kids just like mob this girl. And true, they were jubilant on her behalf. And I found that so uplifting because it's certainly not typical. Um, you know, so instead of this kind of envious despising of someone else's success, they really took joy. And I think that's another element that we need to move into the, uh, I think it's a guy named Jules Henry who talked about this, some old timer dude about education, where he just said, the way it is now, we take joy in other people's failure because we prop ourselves up by inference. But what if we didn't do that? What if we supported each other when we didn't do well and we're just utterly exuberant when we did, wouldn't that be great?